Well, hi, everybody. I'm Don Stewart. Welcome to another edition of Breaking News. Today is Monday, the 5th of February, 2024. And as always, we have some very important stories for you that are setting the stage for what the Bible says is going to happen at the end of this present age, which will culminate in the second coming of Jesus Christ, Revelation 19, and all the events that will precede it. Now, we have a second program we do every day called Your Bible Questions Answered. And yesterday, we dealt with one of the most important questions that we get, and one of the most often asked questions we get, get it about every day, and that is how does Revelation chapter 9 relate to Revelation 16? And what we said, there's four common mistakes that are made. First of all, Revelation chapter 9 is talking about a demonic army, not a human army, but Revelation 16, the campaign of Armageddon is talking about a human army, not a demonic army. So we, we said they are not talking about the same skirmish, the same battles. Therefore, we said the kings of the East that are mentioned there in Scripture cannot be equated with the 200 million man army. You can't do that and put those together because it's two different skirmishes, two different events. And we said also the East in John's day had nothing to do with the Far East, China and Japan or in any country like that. So anyway, this is from our book, 45 Common Mistakes About Last Day's Bible Prophecy Cleared Up. So we, we, we dealt with that one. Hopefully you've... Uh, uh, you know, watched it. And uh, again, this is from our book too. So you can download the uh, content of that. Uh, every book we do is free here at educatingourworld.com. We have tw uh, 11 different topics, 65 different books, all in PDF form, uh, number tw 12 different books on Bible prophecy. And one of them is the uh, 45 common mistakes that are made uh, today. And we're clearing them up because they're, it's funny because I'm looking at these mistakes and thinking about them. I, I probably made at least half of them in my early career. Uh, I made this mistake of equating Revelation 9 and 16. And again, further study showed me I was making a mistake doing that. Well, anyway, what we're going to do today, and I think you're going to like this, we're going to talk about the Gog-Magog invasion in two parts. The first uh, thing we're going to do is look at the disputed issues on this Ezekiel 38, 39 invasion. We're going to do that today. Then tomorrow, we're going to give various timing views of when it would take place because these two questions come up all the time. So hopefully that'll help. And the good news is all of this is documented in our book. So we'll talk about that where you can read it, print it out, do whatever you wish to do with it because there's so much content there. Just like yesterday, we said, please read what we've written because there's so much content there and it's hard to get it across in, in a 20 minute or so period or less than 20 minutes. All right, the headlines today, <laughs> more of the same. Headline number one, it's an opinion piece from the Jerusalem Post, and it's something we've said, and it's not new. It's time for the West to confront Iran directly. Oh, really? Uh, we've been saying that for years. But this is one in interesting here. This is a person who has actually spoken before. The, his name's Vahid Beheshti, I guess that's how you pronounce it. And it's an interesting opinion piece because it's saying what we've been saying, like I said, over and over again. But we're going to see the problem with uh, trying to advocate this. The killing of three American soldiers and the injuring of 25 at a military base in Jordan by the Shiite militias operated by Iran and Syria should be the decisive turning point in the Middle East. So, you know, this attack against Americans is an attempt by the Islamic Republic to test whether the West in general, and the United States in particular, are capable of responding. That's a great way of putting it. Are they? Are we capable? Are they going to do it, anything? For years, Iran has waged a proxy war against the United States and its allies in the region, almost undisturbed. This must stop. There can be no more pretending. No kidding. Uh, this is a direct Iranian attack on the United States, and it should be treated as such. Otherwise, the Iranians will continue to attack with more courage, more force, and more bloodshed. It sounds like he's been reading our stuff. Anyway, the recent attack is not a sign of the strength of the Islamic Republic, but a sign of the weakness of the United States and the West against Iranian terror. That's a nice way of putting it. In recent months, the Houthis receiving support from Iran have been attacking shipping routes in the Red Sea with drones and naval missiles, claiming to target ships associated with Israel in response to the fighting in Gaza. This is a lie. Israel's legitimate war in Gaza is an excuse for Iran to demonstrate power and control uh, and control a significant portion of international shipping routes. There is no doubt that the, the decision to launch missiles against the civilian vessels was made by the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, in Tehran. Again, there is no doubt whatsoever. This can be easily inferred according to weapons experts. All the missiles are produced by the Revolutionary Guard's military industries. No kidding, again. 
So what are Iran's goals? The author goes on to say, Iran's goal is clear. A threat to international maritime shipping affects trade and the economy worldwide. Energy supply, food, infrastructures, humanitarian aid, political stability, environmental protection, international relations. International maritime shipping is vital to the functioning of the global economy, cooperation between countries, and the standard of living, this is really important, of countries and the prevention of conflicts. Therefore, this is you know, very wise the way he put this, Iran's attacks on maritime shipping must be examined in a broader context. The efforts of the Revolutionary Guard are part of their broader strategy to weaken the entire West. This complements their activities for many years to control the global drug trade, human trafficking, and migration. All of this is intended to weaken democratic countries and their way of life and influence the economies and demographic structure of the West. The ultimate goal is the radicalization of the Muslim populations living in Western countries. And may I add, with the Shia Muslims, the ultimate goal is basically to destroy the Western world and let there be a, have to be a nuclear holocaust to allow their imam, the 12th imam, the final Mahdi to come in, which will bring Islamic rule uh, to the entire world. That is the last day's view of, the, of Shia Islam, which Iran, of course, is a part of this. All right. He goes on to say, Although the IRGC does not openly declare war, they're actively working to dismantle the infrastructure of democratic societies by exploiting their weaknesses. And it gives examples of that hiking of the prices, this and that. It's particularly critical in the Middle East, which is advancing toward a split between pragmatic and moderate countries. In other words, it's trying to split even the, the coalitions together in the Middle East. Um, the moderate countries, mainly Sunni Muslims, because uh, they have a different view of how the world will end. Uh, their eschatology, their last day's view, says it's not going to be by some war as opposed to Shia, but it's going to be by just taking over swaths, parts of the world, which eventually you basically take over all of it. So the access of evil as regional dominance for the sake of it's is for the sake of larger imperialist imperialist and imperialist ambitions. Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and the Islamic Republic and Al Qaeda suspicions are just arms of the octopus. Any attempt to cut off an arm will lead to the rapid recovery of the body. Therefore, if you want to neutralize the arms, you must attack the head. So he uses the head of the octopus rather than the head of the snake. And it's probably a better analogy because the octopus has, you know, many tentacles as it were here. So to convey the message he talks about, he's launched a campaign in Britain aimed at it putting the Revolutionary Guard on a list of terrorist organization, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Iran is confident and secure in itself because it sees the West as weak and unresponsive. This only strengthens its global aspirations. It's time to stop playing into the hands of Iran and stop fighting only the arms of the octopus. It's time to confront them directly. Well, that couldn't be more true. And again, we've said that for years. It's This is not a something new. Israel's been saying this for years, but it's interesting. This is... Uh, getting more uh, play today, and in particular because of the deaths of these three American heroes, the soldiers there in Jordan, in the military base that's there. Sounds good, but here's the problem, people. Story number two. Iran says U.S. avoided strike in Islamic Revolutionary Guard. Iranian sources told Qatari news source Al Jazeera, Jazeera Saturday that no targets involved with the country's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps were attacked in the series of strikes carried out against Iran-backed militias by the United States. Washington's report about a strike against the Quds force in Syria are false. This is clear aggression against Syria and Iraq, which harms the stability in the region, the sources say. Well, whether that's true or not, it, the U.S. hasn't taken on Iran directly. They said, well, we may do it. You know, Iran better look out, but they're not. They're not doing it at all. And so when you have the superpower in the world that has the military power, the military strength to do this and not doing anything of the sort, just cutting off the arms or the, you know, the tentacles of the octopus rather than getting to the head, then you're going to have the same old, same old, because they could care less. We talked about this, about whether the Houthis uh, have loss of life, whether Gaza and Hamas, uh, you know, loses thousands of their people, uh, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, same thing. They don't care because it's a means to an end. There's always replacements that they have. And so the U.S. is really doing nothing to fix the problem. So the problem's going to continue. Now, in the meantime, we go to Israel. Hamas signals positive direction and hostage deal decision. Uh, here we go again. Israel has previously stated it believes that Hamas's response to the deal has been delayed due to differences of opinion between uh, leaders in Gaza and abroad. 
Hamas leaders uh, abroad and in Gaza are expected to go in a positive direction. This is the latest, what we're hearing, during the hostage deal negotiations following a round of consultation. This is according to reports by the Lebanese Al-Akbar newspaper on today, Monday. The leadership of Hamas abroad has completed a first round of consultations that included the senior officials of the terrorist organization, as well as the leadership of Islamic Jihad and other Palestinian factions. Al-Akbar claimed that the leadership of Hamas has updated the Qatari side on the atmosphere of what they believe will be a general framework for the answer, which is a focus on the urgency of ensuring that in any proposal, there will be a clear and direct provision regarding a complete cease fire in the Gaza Strip and the promise of guarantees that emphasize Israel's commitment to stopping the war at the end of an exchange between hostages and the Palestinian prisoners. So here we go. We'll do a deal, but what you, you want your hostages back, you give us, you know, uh, like we said the other day, 150 prisoners for each female Israeli soldier. And so, you know, we're going to be in the thousands probably by the time we're done here. This is what the, they want. And then once that's done, fighting's over, you you put it in stone so there's no more skirmishes there, end of the stopping the war, and uh, we just move on from there. And in other words, Hamas wins, Israel loses, the West loses, and this is the proposal they're putting together right now. Now, that's not good news. But here's even worse news. Again, what we've been talking about, but we're seeing more and more headlines. Headline number four, U.S. pressure on Israel to end the war mounts as Hamas hostage detail stalls. Washington believes the only prolonged break in fighting would convince Riyadh to restart normalization talks. Aware of the U.S. plan, Hamas seeks might seek to derail efforts. No kidding. Meanwhile, humanitarian pause appears more feasible than a comprehensive agreement. But the U.S. is pressuring Israel. You got to stop this war. You got to, you know, have like a, a, a truce. You know, they talk about a six-week truce. If you, if you have a truce for six weeks, the war is over. I'm sorry. You don't have your troops just sitting there for six weeks as sitting ducks in, in Gaza. It just can't happen. So here's the idea. The U.S. is exerting heavy pressure on Israel to agree to a deal with Hamas for the release of the hostages held in the Gaza Strip, even at a high cost. Sources involved told the negotiations told Ynet News on Sunday. Ynet is an Israeli news source. So here we go. Let's sum it up. Here we are. Need to cut off the head of the octopus. They're disrupting the entire Middle East, in particular, constantly tormenting Israel and the U.S. But Joe Biden and the U.S. administration doesn't do anything about it. Hamas drags things out, so the patience is wearing thin from the U.S. and the European allies. Therefore, there is enormous pressure on Israel to stop the fighting. And if that takes place, it's a victory for Hamas. It signals terrorists, hey, you'll be victorious if you do this. So let's just do it again elsewhere because um, the West has no, no stomach for any continual you know, fighting there. And it's just Israel when they don't care about them. So here we are, Israel again, continual search for peace as we talk about on our 25 signs. We're near the end, uh, hemmed in from every side. And like Zechariah tells us at the time of the very end, every nation either regionally or worldwide will be against the nation of Israel. And that's where it's moving towards right now. All right, that's enough for this edition of Breaking News. Hope to see you later when we talk about uh, Ezekiel 38, uh, 39. We have two issues we're going to deal with today. The first one will be an overview of the problems that are there, of that the issues that need to be faced. And our, our next one tomorrow, we'll look at the various scenarios of the time frame of this invasion sometime in the future. Until then, I'm Don Stewart. Thank you so much for watching, and may the Lord richly, richly bless.